Thank you very much. Uh, welcome back. And uh, thanks for being here. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this great workshop. Very, very enjoyable. And uh, I learned a lot, so that's, this is perfect. I'm a very selfish type of guy. I want to learn things in workshops. So. But here, I will also try to um, tell you a few things about um, our work on bismuth ferrite. And um, this is actually amazing. It's the first time I'm at a workshop or a conference where I'm the only guy talking about bismuth ferrite. <laughs> it's <laughs> purely amazing. So, but anyway, <laughs> I'll try to do a good job and to demonstrate that it, this is a great material. So this work was done in the CEA in, in Saclay in France and uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, people who make uh, the samples in uh, the Unité Mixte in uh, Senorestales. Okay, so a few words about spintronics and antiferromagnetic spintronics. Of course, I don't have to sell antiferromagnetic spintronics to you, but I want to make um, a couple of, um, of points. The first one is that in conventional spintronics, then people used to use metals, and more and more, because of dissipation uh, problems mainly, uh, they try to use pure spin currents and therefore ferromagnetic insulators. <coughs> Now, in uh, antiferromagnetic spintronics, of course, you know very well the, the, the main points or the main advantages of, of, uh, of doing spintronics with antiferromagnets, namely that there is no magnetization, no stray field, and potentially the dynamical properties are, are much faster. Uh, the thing is that I would like to underline that antiferromagnetic insulators uh, could be very attractive in this, um, in, in this field. Uh, why would they be? For a few reasons. The first one is that they are very common in nature. I mean, most materials are actually, uh, most oxides are antiferromagnetic. So you have a, you have a huge variety of, of oxides you can, you, can, uh, you can choose from. You have, uh, therefore, very different structures and symmetries. So the, if you want a, a specific symmetry, you can most probably find it in an antiferromagnet. Also, you have a lot of multifunctional materials. So this is, a, this is a real added value because you can couple two other parameters. And we will see that this is what happens in bismuth ferrite. And the last point is that the dynamical properties of insulators are probably much better than, than, that, than those of metals because of the same reasoning as for ferromagnets. Huh? So, let's, uh, so we chose, uh, for all these reasons, we chose antiferromagnetic insulators uh, to work with. But the problem uh, with these things is that you can't measure uh, uh, AMR or, or, or resistivity. Yeah? So on a, as you noticed, uh, many, many people use AMR to, to read or, or, or transport to write. Uh, but with antiferromagnets, you, you, you cannot do that. So you have to develop something else to actually look at the, the antiferromagnetic order. And what we, uh, what we chose, oh, just a few words then before going to the technique. A few words about uh, nickel oxide. So the pro prototypical antiferromagnet, uh, insulating antiferromagnet, would be nickel oxide. Now, nickel oxide, uh, it gets very complicated when you talk about antiferromagnetism because you have two things to consider when you consider domains uh, in, in antiferromagnetic materials. First is the staggered direction. And in the staggered direction for nickel oxide, it's along the 111 direction, so therefore you can have four staggered uh, direction domains. These are called the T domains. Then within these domains, you have three possibilities for the spin orientation. So these are called S domains. So therefore, in just pure nickel oxide, you have 12 possible antiferromagnetic domains. And normally, when you grow a thin film, you get more or less all of them. So it's a real mess. Now, a nice thing about using a multiferroic as I will show you, is that you can reduce the number of these variants. Why? Because you couple to another, uh, uh, another parameter, and this other order parameter will actually uh, uh, force one of these, uh, of these antiferromagnetic domains. Actually, of course, it will, well, in that case, it won't force only one, as, as I will show you, but it will, it will um, kill a lot of these possibilities. It will actually reduce them to three. Okay, so um, the multiferroic I'm going to use is bismuth ferrite. And bismuth ferrite is also the prototypical uh, multiferroic because it's the only one working at room temperature. So in these multiferroics, uh, basically the idea there is to have, uh, for example, a polarization, a magnetization, or strain. 
very often what you want to have is these two and that they have to talk to, to, to one another. So basically you want your electrical polarization to be linked to your magnetization. If you could have that, that would be perfect because then you can probably uh, write your, your mem a memory, for example, a memory state, you can write it electrically and read it magnetically, which is, which is the best compromise. So the, the idea here is uh, let's get a, a material that has two order parameters and uh, you hope that they are coupled. And if they are coupled, then you can play uh, with one uh, to influence the, the other one. Okay, so here is bismuth ferrite, so that's, uh, that's the way it works. So bismuth ferrite is a ferroelectric material. Uh, so basically it's, um, uh, it's a perovskite structure that is uh, slightly elongated along the long diagonal, so it's thrombohedral. And then the, uh, the bismuth and the oxygen uh, ions are slightly displaced because of this lone pair of bismuth, which is quite well known. And these atomic displacements make a very large polarization. It's actually the largest polarization, polarization known for any uh, ferroelectric material. And uh, magnetically speaking, it's a G-type antiferromagnet. But uh, there is some complications because of magnetoelectric coupling. And the complications uh, come from, uh, I don't have time to explain this in details, but the magnetoelectric coupling, what it does is that indeed it couples the S with the P. And the way it does it is through this uh, uh, magnetoelectric interaction, which looks exactly like a jalonsky moria term. So basically, you have jalonsky moria but the, the nice thing about this is that your jalonsky moria is linked to the polarization of your material. In fact, the P determines the, the direction of D, your jalonsky moria vector. Okay, so in the, what that makes in the bulk sample uh, it leads to a cycloidal ordering. So you have this antiferromagnetic uh, lattice, like this, and then your antiferromagnetic lattice uh, uh, rotates in a, in a cycloidal order on a long-range cycloidal order, 64 nanometers, so it's incommensurate with the, with the lattice. Now, importantly for, for my work, uh, you can destabilize this cycloid and you can actually kill it. And the way uh, to kill it is either you apply a very large field, but uh, an another way, easier than applying 30 tesla, is uh, to strain it. So if you grow it on a strained film, on a strained substrate, for example on STO, where the cell parameter is, is, is uh, smaller than BFO, then uh, you induce some anisotropy, and if the, the anisotropy is large enough, then you, you make this, uh, this cycloid unstable and you recover a G-type antiferromagnet. So this is what happens in, in our samples. Uh, now, as I said, we need to image them and we need to see the, the antiferromagnetic do domains if we want to do anything with, with them. And the way we do this is by uh, developing a second harmonic generation imaging uh, setup. And uh, the way this works is the following. Uh, if you have any non-central symmetric material and if you send uh, some light at uh, um, omega, then uh, because of this non-central symmetry, you have this emits at omega but also at two omega. And the omega is, uh, is interesting, of course, but the omega, there is a lot of the incident light that is at omega. So if you, if you check the, the light at two omega, then the two omega light is only due to the lack of symmetry uh, of your sample. So basically what generates these two omega lights is either the non-central symmetry, which could be special non-central symmetry, like in ferroelectrics, or time invariant uh, uh, non-central non symmetry, like for magnetism in general. But this works as well for antiferromagnetism or for ferromagnetism. So therefore this is a great technique because in this blue light that exits your sample, then you have the exact information about the, the time inversion symmetry breaking, which is the antiferromagnetic vector. So this has been uh, applied uh, quite a bit, but not by too many groups actually, and the, the, the main players here are, are Manfred Fiebig's group in ETH now, where, where they could see that you can, uh, you can observe uh, using second harmonic uh, imaging, you can observe ferroelectric domains and antiferromagnetic domains, and you can, you can study their, their, their coupling. This was done in, uh, uh, this I think was yttrium manganite, where the domains are, are very, very big, this was single crystals, and we have been developing this, uh, this technique in, in our lab uh, with a slight different uh, uh, change compared to, to Manfred's setup, is that we, uh, we dedicated a lot of efforts to have a very nice uh, lens in order to image uh, with some micron resolution. 
So basically, the way it works is that we have a femtosecond laser, we send pulses, we have something here that's called an OPA that can change your wavelength. Uh, so the initial wavelength is 800 nanometers, but then with this OPA, we can go from 560 to 2,500 uh, nanometers. So we can, we can scan the whole range of, of wavelengths. Then we go through uh, polar polarizers, basically. Then we have the sample, and then after the sample, you have an objective and, of course, the filter to filter the first harmonics. And so with this, we can, uh, uh, when you analyze the second harmonic light, as I said, you basically have the signature of the symmetry of, of what generated that light. And uh, the signature of symmetry is actually a great thing, but uh, it's, um, it has two disadvantages. The first one is that um, it's really tedious to go through all these tensors. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a pain, uh, well, for me anyway. But uh, you have to do it. And the second thing is that if your symmetry is very low, then you have loads of different uh, parameters in your tensor. So for example, if it's monoclinic, then you have 10 independent parameters. So with 10 parameters, you can fit more or less everything. Yeah? Uh, if it's rhombohedral, uh, 3M, like uh, bismuth ferrite, then you only have four independent parameters. And this is good because this means that if you have your full analysis of uh, polarization, uh, um, incident light and you analyze that light, then you can, you can extract these, uh, these four independent parameters and you can get lots of information, even quantitative information on your, uh, on your material and on your order. So, um, okay, now let's, uh, let's go to the experiment. So here is the sample. The sample is uh, bismuth ferrite that is grown on strontium titanate with a uh, uh, strontium rutinate layer, a bottom layer, which is a conducting layer. So uh, in, uh, in bismuth ferrite, you have, uh, again, along the polarization goes along the 1, 1, 1 direction. So you have eight different polarization direction, directions possible. And uh, for each of these polarization domains, you have three possible directions of the L vectors. So these are there. So if P is like this, then you have the one that points here, the one that points 120 degree, and the other one at another 120 degrees. So this reflects the, the rhombohedral symmetry of the, of the crystal structure. Okay, so um, the, the nice thing here is that if you can have only one polarization, then you can only have these three domains. So therefore, if you can write a single polarization domain in BFO, then antiferromagnetically, you, you have only three choices. So this reduces a, a lot, the, let's say, the 12 possible uh, domains to, to only three. So this is what we have for the ferroelectric configuration of the, of the BFO layer. So the BFO is grown along the 001. The polarization lies along the 111. And you can, uh, you can image this polarization by uh, 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 an instrument called PFM. So it's a piezo force microscope. And it's uh, with a tip you can scan. I don't really have time to explain. But you can do two things. You can get the out-of-plane projection of the polarization and the in-plane projection of the polarization. And the as-grown films, this, this is the way they, they, they look like. Uh, they have uh, out of plane the two possible orientations and in plane the four possible orientations. So basically, the as-grown samples have uh, the eight uh, polarization, polarization variants. So there's not much you can do in there, especially since uh, you can see that the scale of these things is about uh, 100 to 200 nanometers. So with an optical technique like ours, there is no way we are going to, to, to see what, what happens in this because our resolution is limited by the wavelength and therefore we, can have a, we cannot have resolutions better than 500 nanometers. So we, we cannot see that. But there is a trick. The trick is that you can use your PFM, uh, your tip of the PFM to actually write uh, single ferroelectric domains. This is a little tricky in this configuration because the polarization being along the 111 directions if you apply a vertical uh, electric field, then you still have four variants that, that, can, that can be stable. But anyway, there are tricks, there are tricks to, to do it. And it's possible then to write uh, a single domain, as, as can be seen here. So this is the out-of-plane component, this is the in-plane component along the X, and this is the in-plane along the Y. And you can see that for this domain, for example, uh, we, we did write a single ferroelectric domain. And this is a, a 10 by 10 domain. So we have 10 by 10 microns where we know that P is constant and it's along one of these variants that we call P3 plus. Now you can, you can notice here that we, we tried to do the same here, but it didn't work. 
uh, in this domain, uh, the, the, the writing did not work so well. So we don't have a single domain, but we have bi-domains, actually. They're also about 100 nanometer in size, but you have two variants in, in there, two polarization variants in there. But let's focus on, uh, on the one that is single domain. So um, we send our second harmonic on, on this thing. The first thing we do is we do some uh, spectroscopy. Uh, we have the, the gap here of the, of the BFO, and we can see that we have some in-gap states. And the interesting thing is that if we image in the in-gap states, we can see that for some states, we have, this is the, the 10 by 10 uh, fully polarized uh, pattern. And inside, you can see that there's little, little worm-like structures here, uh, which, which are contrast. Uh, whereas I for some other energies, you have no contrast whatsoever. So this, this is known because this depends on the, on the exact transitions. And uh, this, this was done before. Depending exactly on where you are, you can have either uh, purely uh, structural contrast or structural plus magnetic contrast. So we just have to position ourselves to the right wavelength. In, in our case here, it was, uh, the incident wavelength was about 925 in our, in our case. And when you do that, this is, this is what you get. So that's, the, uh, that's what we do. We send here the light. It's polarized here. It hits this uh, BFO sample. This is the 10 by 10 square. And then uh, here we filter. We get only the two omega light, and then we image. So first, I want to mention that if you look at that in, in linear optics, so you, you, you don't look at the two omega, but you just look at omega, you see nothing. It's completely black. When you look at the two omega, you see this. So it's, uh, it suddenly appears. And the patterns you can see are different depending on the polarization angle, the incident polarization angle. You can see it goes from 0, 45, 90, 135. So what, what we do here is that in, in order to, to find out exactly what happens, uh, this is what we did. We rotate the polarization of our light. We analyze along only one direction. And uh, for the full rotation, this is, this is what you get. So you get these, uh, uh, these things that, that really uh, flash out for some angles and, and are very uh, um, dimmed for some other angles. And you can see that you have patterns here. And the thing is, if you, if you look very well, you, you, you feel that uh, when, you, when you rotate the polarization angle, the, 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 the thing changes and it kind of moves. And the reason why it moves is because you have three possible domains. And these three possible domains, unfortunately, are at 120 degrees from, from one another. So when you rotate your polarization, you will, you will shine one of these domains. And then if you rotate more, you will shine another one of these domains. So therefore, you always get the, basically the projection of your L vector onto the incident light polarization. So therefore, it, it seems to move, but it's just because you have to reconstruct uh, properly, so that's that's what you. So yeah, w what we did is that we took we took every single pixel of the picture that I showed you, and every single pixel, you can plot this polar plot. This is the dependence on incident polarization angle. If you do those polar plots for every single pixel, you find that you have mainly two asymmetrical populations, which are these two. So you can see here, you have basically two big lobes, and plus two small ones that are either tilted this way or tilt, tilted, uh, sorry, tilted this way or tilted that way. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is what you have. Now, you can fit this when you do the, the analysis. And you have to consider two things. You have to consider that uh, you have uh, two components in what you observe. The first one comes from the crystallographic part, which is the ferroelectricity. And this is, this is the main one. And the second one is the time non-invariant uh, susceptibility. And this is the magnetic, the L vector. So if you consider this, you can fit uh, the, the, the data this way. You have this gray thing is the ferroelectric contribution. It's the main one in, in our sample. And this little white thing here, this is linked to the uh, L vector of the antiferromagnetic uh, structure. OK, so in this population, the L vector is actually like this. And in that population, it's actually like that. And in this one, it's actually like this. And what you see here is just the projection of the L vector on the plane of your sample. So you can fit all this, and you can def therefore, uh, okay, th this works very well when you consider the only three possible domains and, and, and how they project on the xy plane. So then we can reconstruct the, the image, and this is what we get. So this is the reconstructed antiferromagnetic image of this 10 by 10 single ferroelectric domain. So you have basically here two domains, the red and the, and the blue ones, and um, there is one missing. And this white domain, you can see, is only in between at the border of these two. And then this blue on, on red is the signature of the asymmetry. So this is a criterion that we took to check the asymmetry of our polar plot. 
And the asymmetry is in one direction for the red, in the other direction for the blue, and there is no asymmetry in the white. And you can see that the white corresponds only to the, to the, do, to the borders between uh, blue and, and red domains. So therefore, uh, the symmetrical domain, the one that projects symmetrically, is, is completely missing. And this can be understood because, uh, because of strain. The substrate strains it, and therefore it uh, lifts the degeneracy between these three domains. And you only have two degenerate domains, domains, which are the blue and the red here, and the white one uh, gets higher in, in, in energy. So therefore it disappears. So we can see here that basically what we get is two uh, different uh, domains. And their typical size is about one micron. Interestingly, you can see that in the second pattern, which is not a, a single domain one, you also have, a, have some, something that, that, uh, that looks the same, and it's also in the, also in the micron range. And this is interesting because this means that antiferromagnetic domains can actually be larger than the ferroelectric domains. And this is a little bit like uh, when you have a, a granular uh, a medium in a, with ferromagnets. Uh, what happens is that if the granularity is too small compared to the length scale of the magnetism, then you, you, you see just a global average and you decouple uh, the, two, the two length scales. So here, this is what you have. The ferroelectric domains are so tiny that the antiferromagnetic order just sees a big average, and therefore, it recovers its natural uh, size of, let's say, one micron. OK, now we can, uh, we can, do, um, we can do a lot, lot of, lots of things once we have that. It took us a, a while to set up the, took, took us about a year and a half to set up the, the thing. But now we have the images, and we can, do, uh, we can play around with them. So this is another uh, eight by eight. Uh, um, uh, domain, single domain, and what we did here is that we, we wrote uh, electrically here, we, we switched the polarization of this corner up left and this corner uh, uh, down right. So we switched these two things and then you can re-image magnetically and you can see that you have changed completely, of course, the antiferromagnetic domain. So what you have here is the, uh, the demonstration that indeed magnetoelectric writing works, so you change the polarization Therefore, you change basically the anisotropy of your, uh, of your uh, magnetism, and therefore you, you change completely the patterns. You can see here that in these 2 by 2.5 by 2.5 microns, we have more or less a single antiferromagnetic domain. Now, there's other things we, we can do. So we, we played around with a few things. Here is an, uh, another of these, um, uh, of these patterns that we wrote uh, ferroelectrically. Here we have three variants of polarization. We have one big like this, and we rewrote inside th this thing. In fact, originally we wanted to write just another P2 variant, but uh, it turned out that, that there's two variants. And in, in that sample, uh, the first thing is that we imaged the corresponding uh, antiferromagnetic pattern. This is what, what we have. Again, only uh, red and blue, and the white is not, not quite here. But then we did a few things. First thing that we did is that we heated the sample to uh, 570K, which is about, uh, let's say, 50 Kelvin below the nail temperature. And then we re-imaged, and you can see that this has changed considerably. So if you heat up your, your sample, not, not even reaching the, the Curie point, then the antiferromagnetic domains move and rearrange, and, and, and you get another pattern. Now, this is kind of understandable because the energy of these domains is exactly the same, so they are completely degenerate, and probably there is very little energy that tells them uh, the, way, the way they should behave. It's not like in, in the ferromagnet where the, the stray fields uh, do the job. Now, we, we did some, something a little bit different here. We thought, okay, let's take this uh, sample, and what we do now is that we take the PFM tip and we apply a voltage, but we, we remain sub-coercitive. So we do not change the ferroelectric uh, polarization, so we stay below the, feral, the coercivity for, the, for, for uh, reversing the ferroelectric polarization. And when we do that, we ramp from 2 volts at the tip to 12 volts, and 11 volts is the, is the, the coercivity. So this, this last row is actually ferroelectrically changed. But you can see here that uh, basically everything has changed in this pattern, except maybe here. So the, the first row here at 2 volts is about the same as this one. but then as soon as you exceed two volts, you, you, you change the pattern. So what does it mean? That means that you can write antiferromagnetically without affecting the ferroelectric polarization. So now we can, we can dissociate the, the ferroelectric writing and the antiferromagnetic writing. And then we thought, okay, this, um, 
This maybe can be done uh, in a more clever way, and the more clever way is to use our femtosecond laser. And how do we do that? So this is, um, this is the idea. The idea is that you, have, uh, you can have optical rectification in BFO, so you, you send a, a femtosecond pulse. This femtosecond pulse, because BFO is a, it actually <laughs> generates second harmonic, it also generates a DC equivalent to the second harmonic uh, uh, polarization. And when, it, when you do that, the DC is just the envelope of your pulse. And it turns out that for our femtosecond laser, uh, the envelope of the pulse is uh, of the order of, let's say, 150 femtoseconds. So it's in the terahertz range. So therefore, when you, uh, when you shoot at the sample with a, with a femtosecond laser, if you go hard enough, then uh, you, can, you can send a, a large electric field, but in the terahertz regime. So this has been demonstrated, and this is what we used. So that's what we did. We took the initial AF images here, and then we basically we multiplied by three the power of our incident light. And when you do that, you can see that the final image has completely changed. So and the, um, the estimated uh, electric pulse is now 0 0.1 millivolts, um, sorry, megavolt per meter, which is about, um, it's an order of magnitude lower than that with a DC electric field. Okay, so being resonant, let's say, or at least hitting in the terahertz range, allows us to be much more efficient in the, in the rewriting of, of these states. Okay, I'm reaching my conclusions. Um, so I hope I've convinced you that uh, second harmonic generation is a very powerful technique to image the, uh, these uh, antiferromagnetic domains. It's, of course, very well suited to insulators because you have uh, our setup is in transmission, so you have to go through the, the sample anyway and uh, you don't need any transport in here. And I couldn't resist uh, but showing you um, a, a sad story that happened to us, is that we thought, okay, we'll, um, this is the resolution and it's limited by our wavelength, so let's go to the PIM. So we went to the synchrotron and we did PIM, and we thought, well, PIM, the resolution is like 20 nanometers, it will be wonderful, we'll be able to compare. And um, the PIM session was actually during uh, Christmas holidays uh, last year. And uh, this is what happened after the PIM session. So uh, I thought um, uh, Jean-Yves, the postdoc who was with me, was going to kill himself. Uh, what we had uh, written uh, nicely with the PFM, uh, ferroelectric pattern, was completely destroyed by the beam of the synchrotron. So just to show here that for insulators, the PIM is not fantastic, of course. I mean, this is not a, a big surprise. But even in that case where we have an underlayer that is conducting, uh, the PIM generates, well, the PIM is so intense, oh, sorry, the, 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 the beam is so intense that it generates a lot of photo-emitted carriers, and these photo-emitted carriers are, are completely scrambled the polarization that we had written here. So we could not image anything. So just to say that the second harmonic is, is, is great. Uh, uh, another few conclusions is that, so the, the natural domain size in BFO or in that film was about the micron range. And the interesting thing here is that it's in the micron range when the ferroelectric domains are tiny and when the ferroelectric domains are very big. And the interaction between the ferroelectric order and the antiferromagnetic order is a little complex and therefore the, the, the length scale of these two uh, will, will play a role, of course. And I think the, uh, they will really talk to, to one another when the length scale is, is about the same. So uh, typically, uh, if you write, as we did, uh, two micron ferroelectric domains, you can increase the antiferromagnetic domain size to two microns. So you can actually have a one-to-one -one correspondence. But as soon as you are either too big with your ferroelectric domains or too small, then the uh, antiferromagnetic uh, uh, natural size is recovered. It's about one micron. Um, we can see here in BFO that we have two antiferromagnetic domains that, that, that are degenerate and they can be destabilized very easily. It's probably because they are degenerate in energy that any kind of stimulus that, that, that you put will actually scramble your, your, um, your, your pattern. Uh, very interestingly, uh, with the femtosecond laser, we could uh, induce these terahertz electric pulses, which opens the door for an all optical control of antiferromagnetic writing. Of course, so far, we have done nothing deterministic. It's all uh, kind of uh, random things, but we can see the, the, the differences, and now we just have to do it in a deterministic uh, uh, manner. But uh, potentially, we, we can write um, uh, and, and read uh, using just a femtosecond laser. 
And the last thing, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know if that's very useful, but uh, this is kind of fun, uh, is that in multiferroics, then you have the possibility to write ferroelectrically and antiferromagnetically. And for example, you could have this kind of two-level coding of information where if you look with first harmonics, you see the ferroelectric writing, and then you look with second harmonics and you see the antiferromagnetic writing. So you can write an information like, I don't know, I was at Spice, uh, and, and, th and then you look at second harmonics and then it's written, uh, I was not at Spice, or something like that. Anyway, so this is, uh, this is maybe uh, useless, but I, I think it's kind of fun to have these two levels of, of, of writing. Uh, maybe for, for spying, maybe that's, that's perfect. Huh? Okay, uh, on, this, uh, on this note, I will stop and thank you again for your attention. <laughs>